Honor all the men and women that are serving all over the world, keeping us safe and fighting for our freedom. And thank you, Christine, for praying over uh, everybody and all the families that have experienced the loss of a loved one or are missing a loved one that's overseas or serving in the military. We honor them today. I know that we hold them dear in our hearts and they'll be on our minds all day long as we get together with family and friends. I'm sure many of you have great get, get togethers planned later today. For those of you that are new, know that ladder is not a decoration uh, for the room. Uh, and I keep looking over there because yeah, I gotta go up uh, six stairs today. So yeah, I'll get into that place where it's gonna be a little difficult. <laughs> Did I get a volunteer, Patty? <laughs> Lots of spider webs, okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've been in the series on the Beatitudes. I don't know about you, but uh, it's been very challenging, uh, certainly in my life, to live this thing out. And especially this week, as I was studying, uh, this week we're on the sixth Beatitude, which is a pure in heart. And the title today is A Pure Heart Will See God. The Beatitudes are found in Matthew uh, chapter 5. And... This is the introduction to Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. This teaching was part of Jesus Christ's intensive discipleship training for his 12 chosen disciples. And these teachings are just as applicable today for those who choose now to follow Christ. The Beatitudes offer solid truths for living as a disciple of Christ. And this is the big thing, while flying in the face of what the world may have taught us about being blessed. So Jesus is teaching about what our attitudes should be. They're called the Beatitudes. And so these are what our attitudes should be found in Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, as he always did. The Beatitudes, here they are. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now each beatitude can stand on its own. But in this particular case, these aren't just merely a collection of unrelated statements. They're linked together like an unbroken chain or a ladder, if you will. One step leads to the next. Each one builds on the previous one. So the first several Beatitudes deal with the condition of our heart and our own need and our desperate position. So being poor in spirit, that first one, meaning we are spiritually bankrupt and we essentially have nothing to offer God. We come to him with open hands instead of believing that you have much to offer the Lord. Secondly, we talk about mourning. And the real realization there is the revelation is that we mourn over our sin and our sin separates us from God. It's costly to me, it's costly to others around me, More, most importantly and supremely, it's costly to my relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we talked about meekness. That was strength under control and getting used to being led by the hand of God, getting used to being led by the Spirit of God. Then the second set of Beatitudes pertains to our relationship with the Lord. That started with the fourth Beatitude that said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what is righteousness? We're building a foundation here, and one, each one adds on to the other. It's a deeper spiritual meaning. Righteousness is the quality of being right in God's eyes, including our character, which is our nature, our conscience, which is our attitude, our conduct, which is our actions, and our commands, which is our words. Righteousness is therefore, therefore based upon God's standard and no one else. No man can attain this through his own efforts. That would be called self-righteousness. We've all heard of that. And then we're into the final grouping of Beatitudes, which speaks to our relationship with others. So the first three were to the roots, poor in spirit, mourning and sin. 
and meekness that leads us to a life of submission to God, putting our mission under his leadership and guidance and direction of the Lord. And those conditions of the heart, which has something to do with our beatitude today, then leads to a life that is hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And then the final group, which we started last week, leads us to a life of producing fruit. The fruit of mercy that we talked about last week. Today we will talk about the fruit of purity of heart. And then next week we will talk about the fruit of peace. Last week we focused on the fruit of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Remember, God loves to give mercy. I pray that you experienced that this week. And last week we talked about mercy loves company. I invite all of you to listen to that on the Rooted Right YouTube page. Today's our focus will be the fruit of a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So we will see God. It looks like this ladder, we're getting closer and closer to God as we keep on moving up the ladder. So who can help me out here? Does anybody remember what this first ladder is that we have to start out every morning? Hit the restart button. Anybody can help me? Or in spirit. spirit. Yeah. And then we do what over our sin? We mourn over our sin. And then how we learn how to walk in meekness. Yeah. And then we thirst and hunger for righteousness. And then we serve a God who is merciful. Whoa. I don't know if I'm going to get six. Hey, there you go. And then today... We're going to Pierre and Hart. Hey! All right, I am close to God. But it's dark up here. I think. All right, I made it. Luke, you get next week. Luke will be crawling up there. All right, praise God. We made it through that. So, what do you think of when you think of bless our, our Pierre and Hart, for they will see God? Let's first uh, describe what a Pierre Hart looks like. A pure heart is a heart that thinks what is right, feels what is good, desires what is best for themselves and others. A pure heart is marked by transparency and an uncompromising desire to please God in all things. It is more than external purity of behavior. It is an internal purity of soul. All right, how are we doing with those definitions inside our mind? I would say that's intimidating to say the least. But what it described here, as I read it, it almost seems impossible. Not too many people would put themselves in that category. If I asked any our congregation this morning who feels like they're pure in heart, I'm not sure many hands would go up. Yet all those other Beatitudes, we may have put ourselves in those categories. We've, we've felt maybe what it's like to be poor in spirit, feeling like we just don't have anything to offer God. We've walked in meekness. We've maybe... Uh, felt mercy or given mercy out before, but pure in heart. And beyond that, if we could achieve such a status as pure in heart, then we will see God. Almost seems unattainable. Maybe a good thing to think about, maybe to strive for. Maybe always feeling as we're striving for it that we're somehow going to fall short. Look at what it says in the Old Testament about seeing God in Exodus 33:20. Said, but he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. But Jesus doesn't say these things to mock us or fool us or mess with us or to frustrate us. He says everything only in truth and something that we can actually stand firm on because it's only his truth that doesn't come back void. Look at what Isaiah 55, 9 through 11 says. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And so here we are even more thankful for what Jesus has done for us on the cross and the access that we have to an almighty God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So even within all our sin, all of our past sin, no matter what we've done or thought or said, 
Now we remind ourselves because of the blood of Jesus and when we are led by the Spirit and when we learn to surrender every area of our lives to Jesus, we can still be pure in heart and we can see God. So what is this purity of heart? Let's first start with what the purity of heart is not. Purity of heart does not mean we have never had a bad thought or never did a wrong action in our mind or in our heart. That should be great relief for everybody in here and a step in the direction of hope. 1 John 1.8 says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Purity of heart is not living a life without sin. We would all be disqualified. I don't know about you. I would have to disqualify myself from the time I got up till the time I walked in to this room. If that was the qualification, is to live a life without sin. But here are three ways to think about purity or holiness. First, there's a purity or holiness that belongs to God and him, him alone. Look at what it says in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, the angels, with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now these were angels of the Lord, and they themselves were holy. But the word holy was not big enough for them to express the difference between their created holiness and God's eternal holiness. And so they say, holy, 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 because he's incomparable in his holiness. There's separation even between the angel's holiness and God's holiness. The angels reflect as created creatures the holiness of God, just like the moon reflects the sun. And just like the angels, there should be a reflection of God's holiness in the life of a believer. The light of holiness in our lives is his alone. And any holiness that comes from him comes from our relationship with him. The second thing, there's a purity of holiness that will be ours in heaven. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says this. See what a great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what, what we will be has not yet been made known. But what we know, that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. In the presence of Jesus, you will have a holiness or a purity that is like pure gold. When Jesus returns, or you're called to heaven, there will be no traces of sin in you, around you, in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And lastly, there's a purity or holiness that we're called to pursue right now. We are not pure gold yet. Somebody say amen. But we have some pure gold mixed in, in our impurities, which is our sin. You have the spirit, the light inside of you, but the sin is mixed in. And God is asking for your heart to be purified and washed by his word. Look what it says in Psalm 119, 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. A Puritan preacher in the 1600s, Thomas Watson, said this. Where there is longing for purity and where there is loathing of impurity, there is indeed a purity of heart. So what does purity of heart mean if it doesn't mean living a sinless life? Here are a couple of attributes of what a heart looks like, a pure heart looks like. A pure heart is a heart that is undivided, a heart that is made clean. Let me repeat that. A pure heart is a heart that is undivided and a heart that is made clean. First, let's look at a blessing of an undivided heart. You can be blessed when your heart is single, whole, united, one, when it's undivided. Matthew 6, 22 in the King James Version says this, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. A single focus. Other translations of that say a healthy or a good focus. And the focus, the single focus, is on living a life that is pleasing to Jesus. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first 
the kingdom and all his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. The opposite of a pure heart is a divided heart. Elijah standing on Mount Carmel. He brought all the prophets together in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. In New Testament terms, in the world we're living in today, the question would be posed to us like this. How long will you go on trying to embrace faith in Jesus Christ and compromise with the world at the same time? As long as your heart remains divided, there is no access to the true blessing that is offered us to us today in today's beatitude. How long are you going to keep toying and playing with the sins of the world, never quite fully giving in to them, but teetering back and forth between faith and flesh, between spirit and natural, without a single focus? James 4.8 says this, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Then Paul in the New Testament shows us what a pure heart looks like when he says these powerful and specific words in Philippians 3. But he first prefaces this scripture by letting us know he's not arrived yet. He does not have it all together. So Paul, writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, doesn't have it all figured out yet. That's good gospel news. And neither do you, and neither do I. But he says, watch this in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do, the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. One thing is purity of heart. Jesus is saying, blessed is the person who is undivided. Psalm 8611 says this, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. If you're new to Rooted Right, you're going to hear scripture after scripture after scripture. And I'm going to keep saying it's the only thing that actually changes our hearts and our minds. So this could be your prayer today. If you're sitting here and you feel like that was a description of you living with an undivided heart, this could be your prayer. Here is my heart, O oh God. You see that it's all over the place. Unite it and make it one. Make it undivided. Make it a single focus and purify my heart. Secondly, we can see the blessing of a clean heart. So we have an undivided heart and now we're looking at what it looks like to have a clean heart. Your faith starts and also forms the bond between you and Christ. When you are in Christ and Christ is in you, multiple gifts are given to believers. That's more big gospel news. Multiple gifts are given to believers, and here are just a few of them. Justification, you've probably heard of that word. That's a legal term. In Christ and through Christ, God drops all charges against you. God laid our iniquity on Jesus, and he paid the price for our sins so that we could have access to eternal life and be allowed in heaven. These sins have already been judged. Your sins, my sins, all of our sins have been judged, punished, and atoned for through his sacrifice on the cross. Isaiah 53 and 5 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That is a spectacular truth. Of justification and it's also seen in Romans 5 1 through 2 therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God a just God cannot demand payment for sin that has already been atoned for a just God does not call in a debt that has already been paid. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and do what? Purify us from all unrighteousness. We have access to all of these things. The second part of that is forgiveness. We talked about justification. Another gift to you as believers is forgiveness. 
This is relational. In Christ, God reconciles you to himself. When God justifies, he also forgives through his son. Romans 4, 6 through 8 says this. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Hallelujah. So forgiveness is relational, but there's two parties involved, as forgiveness always does. True forgiveness. There's the one who's asking for forgiveness. That's us in this case. And then there's the other who has to give forgiveness in order for reconciliation to take place. Don't you pray and believe that some of the people in your life that you want to ask for forgiveness would be so gracious as what our Lord and Savior has done for us. But we play a role and we can start the forgiveness process. Some of us need to think about who we need to ask for forgiveness from this week as we know what our Lord and Savior, the gift that he's given us in his forgiveness. And this is the mercy that we talked about last week in the fifth beatitude. And mercy, remember, is us not getting what we deserve. Mercy is us not getting what we deserve. And then mercy leads us to repentance of our sins, and then we can feel God's love and forgiveness. Hebrews 10, 17 says this, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Micah 7, 19 says this, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot, and don't miss this, hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. As I was studying this week, one pastor said this about that scripture in Micah. After all our sins have been thrown into the depths of the sea, God puts up a big sign that says, no fishing. And how many times have we gone back fishing after our sins? I want you to picture that. True repentance means when you go back to that place, that worn out thought pattern in your mind, that when something happens into your life, that's your go-to. When you start walking down that path again, I want you to see that big sign that says no fishing. The last thing, another gift is cleansing. And that's a personal gift. In Christ, God washes your heart and your life. If you think about a dirty car, uh, my mother-in-law is notorious for <laughs> having to wash her car multiple times a week. <laughs> she can't stand to have any dirt on her car at all. And so it's a wonderful spiritual picture about us. Inevitably, if you drive on the dirty roads or you deal with some elements, your car is going to get dirty. And if you want to take care of it, which if you see my car, I might be a guy that does it oops, maybe a couple times a year, unfortunately. But my mother-in-law does it almost daily. <laughs> and so this is something like a dirty car that we're supposed to be applying to our lives daily. This cleansing, this washing. Look what it says in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So you might also think about clothes. Obviously, our clothes get dirty, and we throw them in the wash. Our Again, I thank God for my wife who's willing to do the laundry. And it's just a nonstop pile all day long, every day with four people in the house. And that's another good picture. We get our clothes dirty. We don't just say, hey, this is dirty. I'm just going to throw it away. We put it in the wash, we clean it, and we wear it again. And that's just another spiritual picture. God doesn't just throw us away when this world has filled us with sin. When we walked into this world and our nature was sinful, when we run to the things that we run to and we've been trapped in our sin, God doesn't just throw us away. He allows us what? To be washed by his word. And when should that be done? Daily. So we have justification, that's legal. 
We have forgiveness. That's relational. Between you and God, identifying your sin, repenting, and asking for forgiveness. And then we have cleansing, and that's personal. And it needs to happen over and over and over again by the blood of the Lamb, what he did for us on the cross, and by his word. Why do we need this? Because we sin. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says this. But if we walk in the light, and he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, this is bringing the darkness to light. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. We just learned about that. And we'll forgive. We just learned about that. And then look what happens. Forgive us of our sins and then purify us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This scripture says that only God can cleanse us and purify our heart. Think about what we run to or the depths that we go to to try and cleanse ourselves. If we're really honest, we actually try and cleanse ourselves sometimes with even more dirt. We try and fix things in the ways of the world tells us to. We try and cover up lies. We try and cover up sin. We run to something else to give us a temporary fix. I call it masking pain. It's always something that this world can offer. Maybe it'll slow down our aging process. We can run faster if we do this. We can jump higher. We can make more money. We can work less. A lot of that going on. We can think clearer. We can take a supplement that will uh, enhance our bodies. There's a new drug out there that we think will be the answer to everything. There's a new kind of alcohol that will give us some type of release. The world constantly has something new to offer us. And especially in the social media world, I didn't write that one on there, but that just hit my spirit. <laughs> we can basically disconnect from our life, go into the world of that is not a reality and sit there and try and mask our pain hour after hour after hour. And it comes down to this though. Faith in Christ is confidence in his ability to justify, forgive, and cleanse through the power of his shed blood on the cross. The real question is, do you trust him? And are you willing to look to Jesus for this cleansing and the actual purifying of your heart? To anyone that has been overcome by their sin, has given into temptation time and time again, has allowed greed or lust or pride or any other sin that you need to fill in the blank with there that's tried to consume you. To anybody that says this statement, and maybe we've all said this at one time or you've been around somebody who said this, have you ever heard this? I just have too much baggage. I just have too much baggage. Have you ever said that? Or has anybody around you? ever said that. This was my go-to when I was living in my sin, trapped in my sin, and some people would get around me and they'd say, what's wrong with you? And I'd look at them and I'd say, how long you got? That was my go-to. How long you got? Many people say they believe in Christ who forgives, but they've not experienced the God of the Bible. The Son of God that we learned about today, who washes and cleanses and purifies messed up human hearts and lives. Christ offers, offers you more than forgiveness. If you only could see this Christ, as our Beatitude talks about today, then we would have hope. Jesus came to deal with compulsive habits, ingrained patterns of thoughts and behavior, and he didn't just come to justify he came to sanctify you and purify you day after day after day. Not only to forgive us of our sins, but also to make us holy and purify us so that we can what? See God. And this is how God saves us. Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the kindness and love of our God and our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy that we learned about last week. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He is able to wash your mind and give you a new life. 
And as he renews your mind, you will begin to hate the things that you used to love. And you will begin to love the things that you used to hate. That's how you know the things that you think that you come live your life without that are not pleasing to Christ, the things that you keep on teetering back and forth as a double-minded and being tossed to and from by the waves. One day you're in, the next day you're running after the things of the world. Then you're going to give it back to Jesus. You're back and forth. There's no singleness of mind. Look at what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. Therefore, if any wasn't, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. So now, when you remember that question that I used to get asked, what's wrong with you? And I have my go-to answer. Now when people come up to me and I haven't seen them for a long time and they say, hey, how are you doing? Anything new going on in your life? Guess what my go-to is? How long you got? In fact, I almost dread it. <laughs> Especially if I, you're on, you gotta be somewhere, you gotta do something. I got, I got a long list of things I could tell anybody and everybody of what God's done in my life in the last couple of years. Because God always takes what the enemy meant for bad and turns it around for his good. And so the person who's thinking that I've gone too far, I've done too much, it's been too many years of it, I got too much of a track record, it's my pattern, and I'm in way too deep. If the baggage you carry is so great, and your mind and your heart you think is so twisted that you really can't imagine ever being whole or having a purified heart. It is especially that for that person today that you make a decision that this is actually where faith begins. Every time you walk in here, I tell you that God's given you another chance. If you woke up today with breath in your lungs and you're gonna sit under the word of God, which is why there's scripture after scripture after scripture, we learn today what we have access to as we go through these Beatitudes and what a blessed life really looks like. Faith begins today, and you can take a first step on that ladder right there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You heard today what Jesus has done for you, what he's given you access to, and how you can live a life with a pure heart. So start with this renewed thought. If you just can't quite go there, that you don't fully believe, your mind isn't fully focused, how about this thought? If I was in Christ and he was in me, I believe that he could make this heart clean. If I was in Christ and he was in me, I believe that he could. Just open up the door. Just let Jesus get a foothold with the door open. We also learn from the word of God today what you have access to in terms of justification, forgiveness, and cleansing. And remember, God is no respecter of persons, meaning what he's done for countless others, for what he's done for many of you in here, and for what he's done for me, he will also do for you. And so just like always, you get to choose. Like we started the day off saying that Jesus had his first 12, those were his chosen, and now we get to choose to be disciples of our Lord and Savior. We get to choose whether or not we want to walk in this blessed life. We get to choose whether or not we're going to allow God to purify our heart so that we can see God. Look what it says in Revelation 3.20. God is not a forceful God. He's not going to make you do anything. And that's why the word choose is so important. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Let today be the day that you choose to serve and receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and let him today begin to purify your heart. If you do make that decision, you're recognizing that you're a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God. You're on your way to a renewed mind and the purification of your heart. Look at what Numbers 23, 19 says. God is not human that he should lie not a human being, that he should change his mind. When I read those Beatitudes, God's word does not come back void, but we play a role in it. If you want to see those Beatitudes come true in your life, 
He's giving us the blueprint. And yes, it goes against many of the things that this world has tried to teach us. But have you ever seen what's on the other side of obedience? Even in just applying, we, we have, there's, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of lessons in the Word of God. But we're just breaking down eight Beatitudes. I don't know why it keeps coming to me, and I know I gave this challenge uh, weeks back in another sermon. But the Lord keeps on impressing on my heart for one year. Have you ever really just done this for one year? Have you ever started each day and read the Beatitudes every morning? For one year. One year to have a single focus, and that's to please Jesus. Are you going to mess up? Yep. Later today, probably by the time you get to the parking lot. Hit the reset button. Start back on the ladder and start walking back up. When you fall off, get back on. Don't fall off and walk away. For one year. And then you tell me. You tell God. Lord, I don't think your word's true. I did this for a whole year. I don't see any difference. I don't see any blessing in my life. The things I've been believing you for all my life, I have not seen come to pass. You just see if that's your testimony. I just have a feeling. I just have a feeling. God wants to absolutely blow your mind. I'm going to say this because there's new people in the room today. Some of you have heard this, and that's fine. It's a good reminder for me and everyone. The sin that I lived in, the lie that I told myself just three years ago, was that I forfeited myself from everything that God is doing in my life today. And this was my thought process. I tell people today that if the Lord would have given me, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow, but if the Lord would give me 40 more years on this earth, I did not think I would be where I am in one year's time by truly repenting from my sins for the first time, really repenting, meaning I'm not going back, meaning that's not an option to go back anymore. And so you're actually all in. It's one of the major reasons why our Rooted Right, the tagline is all in. We can't keep on being a little bit in the world and a little bit in the Word and then blame God for not seeing the results. And we all fall into that category. And so in 40 years, I didn't think I would get to where what God's done in my life and what he did in one year's time. And maybe that's why I keep, I, I don't know, God's a nine-time God. It may take one day. It may take one second this morning. Or it may take ten years. I'm not God. I have no idea. We just read earlier in, in Scripture, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And he's got a better plan than I could ever give to you from this pulpit. But I'm standing here in front of you as a testimony. I never thought I'd be what God's done in my life in one year in the rest of my life, if I would have lived until I was 80 some. And so that's pretty exciting. So what does God want to do now? He finally got you up to the place where he can use you. <laughs> it wasn't just about restoring everything in your life. Oh, that's great. I could just sit back and, hey, just revel in the fruit of, of our, our labor and giving everything over to Christ and starting your day off with prayer every day and diving in the word finally starting the ministry that we were supposed to start 14 years ago and watching restoration in my marriage and, and through our children and watching God open up door after door after door. That's all great. I could just sit there and take that all for myself. But no, when you really you give your life over to Christ, you start to see that it's actually not about you at all. He just wants to use you in other people's lives. And he wants to use your testimony. And every single one of you have a unique testimony. And so I pray this week, that because he's not human, and because he doesn't lie, and because he's not human and he doesn't change his mind like all of us do, that you allow that to sink into your heart. That would be the first thing that would help you purify your heart. Allow that truth to sink into your heart and know that that's good gospel news for this beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's pray. Father, you're such an awesome God. Thank you. For your word. Thank you for your truth. You washed us today like a shower from heaven, a Holy Spirit shower. And Lord, boy, did we need it. Boy, did we need it. We need it every day, Lord. Let us not just have it be this washing that happens on a Sunday morning for one hour or maybe in a Bible study once a week. 
Or maybe when we just start our devotions in the morning. All of those things are amazing. But let us just not check the box. Let us be in pursuit of a pure heart. And Lord, wow, can you show us what it means that we're going to see you? Thank you for all of these beatitudes. Thank you for showing us how to live a blessed life. I pray that each and every one of us start to get a deeper revelation of what this means for our own lives and the way that we can apply it, but also on how we can be a blessing to others. I know you're going to present us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And Lord, you never give up on us. Thank you, Lord. You never give up on us. Some of us have given up on ourselves. Some of us have forfeited. And Lord, we learned today. Wow, you've given us great gifts. Great gifts. Justification. Forgiveness. And cleansing. Hallelujah. Father, would you just let that sink into our heart? this morning as we sit during this reflection time. Would you just minister to us like only you can do? Holy Spirit, have your way. Can we truly connect with our Creator? Put our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Allow you to be in us. Allow you to renew our minds. Allow you to direct our paths this week. Every morning, we start out on the bottom of the ladder. And Lord, we have an opportunity to get closer and closer to you every day. I pray that it would be the testimony of Rooted Right Church and all those that are here today and watching online. That they can say one day, blessed are the pure in heart and that they got to see God. We give all this over to you. We count it all done. We seal it. We thank you for the delivery of your word. Let it not fall on dry soil. Cultivate our heart, Lord. Let those seeds that are planted take root. And let every single person that comes along our path see the fruit that you designed for us all along. In Jesus' name.